Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2023 Milton Convent, or 2024 Milton Convents lecture, uh, given today by Freddie Lutangwa, the CEO of the Aegis Trust at the Kigali Genocide Memorial. I'm Alex Colvin, the Kenneth F. Kahn Dean and Martin F. Scheinman Professor here at the ILR School. I want to thank you all for joining us in person and the many of you who I know are online. I particularly want to thank Erwin and Joan Jacobs, who could not be here in person, but I know watching from home in California. The Jacobses have been extraordinary benefactors of many important causes throughout the world, including many at Cornell. And their support for the university includes scholarships, fellowships, professorships in the College of Engineering and Human Ecology, and the Joan Norman Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute at Cornell Tech. And this lecture here at ILR, for which we're very grateful. Uh, this is ILR's signature annual lecture that honors a founding faculty member of ILR, Professor Milton Convitz. The lecture was endowed in by the, Con by the Jacobses in 2005 to honor the spirit of Professor Convitz's theoretically rich and diverse course, American Ideals. Dr. Jacobs and generations of students, estimates just around 8,000, took this course at ILR. And there's actually now a link on ILR's webpage where you can download and listen to a recording of an entire semester of the course. It's a free course, uh, listen to myself, fantastic lectures. Professor Thomas used to walk in and just start speaking and would give these incredibly rich, complex lectures about uh, American ideals and values. Uh, this lecture each year brings a prominent expert in democratic thought, ethics, or political philosophy to speak to the campus community. And previous lectures have included John Ruggie, Sandra Day O'Connor, Pat Sunstein, Charles Ogletree, Ken Feinberg, and Wilma Lehman, among many others. Word about Professor Convitz. He was born in 1908 and emigrated to the United States in 1915, becoming a citizen of this country in 1926. He received his bachelor in law degrees in 1929 and 1930 from NYU, and his PhD in philosophy from Cornell in 1933. He was not only a remarkable teacher, but also a scholar and citizen. He was an authority on constitutional and labor law and civil and human rights. He served on the faculty here in ILR of Law from 1946 until 1973, and then passed away in 2003 at the age of 95. He was also a devoted public servant of the university, uh, including serving as a founder of the university's Department of Near Eastern Studies and the program of Jewish Studies. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, Freddie Mutanova. As I mentioned, <laughs> Freddie is the CEO of the Aegis Trust at the Kigali Genocide Memorial. Uh, Freddie led the development of Aegis's peace education program in Rwanda and is now leading Aegis's work to take this model beyond the borders of Rwanda to areas at risk, including the Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Kenya. Joining Aegis in 2004 during the construction of the Kigali Genocide Memorial as a team leader responsible for genocide documentation, he was appointed country director in 2006. He holds a master's degree in project management from Maastricht School of Management and trained as a teacher, securing a bachelor's degree in education from the Kigali Institute of Education. He survived the London 1994 genocide as a teenager, ending as an orphan head of his household. In 2016, the Justice Security Foundation declared him a Peace Award winner for his outstanding contribution to peace. He's also profiled in the Atlanta Human Rights Museum as a prominent activist for human rights. And he's an external advisory committee member of the USC Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive in Los Angeles and lectures, lectures internationally on the impact of genocide and the importance of forgiveness as a way of post-conflict re reconstruction. It's our absolute pleasure to welcome today ready to give this year's Thomas lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Dean Kelvin, for a wonderful introduction. And I thank you for the gracious offer to speak at the Cornell. It's my pleasure. Um, I want to add my, my thanks to um, Arwin, Joan Jacobs, um, for their support at the convict uh, lectures. I also want to acknowledge Larina, 
together with me today, uh, IORAL uh, class of 1983. We honor that you join us uh, today for this lecture. And uh, we also, we were also honored that uh, you and your wife and your family visited the Kigali Genesis Memorial in the spring 2023. On behalf of uh, the board and the staff of Aegis Trust, we thank you. We live in the world of conflict, but peace is possible. I know both well that there are terrible heartbreaking conflict, peace, forgiveness, reconciliation, and the justice. We at Aegis Trust, we work to predict, prevent, and eliminate genocide. We do this mainly through education, sharing information, research evaluation, and the power of bringing people together. We also lead the Kigali Genocide Memorial, as you can see in a very beautiful picture. This memorial is the final resting place of more than 250,000 victims of genocide. And this includes my parents and my sisters. First, a little information about Rwanda. Its economy is based on tourism, higher education, technology, and the finance. I invite you to know more and more about, the, about Rwanda. Rwanda today is one of the safest countries in the world. The 1994 genocide against Tutsi did not begin in 1994. During the genocide, Western media showed Rwanda as the warring tribes. But this was not always so. The Hutu, the Tutsi, and the small minority Twa lived in Rwanda for many centuries together. Every Rwandan spoke the same language in Rwanda. We shared the same culture, the same values, same religion. There were no massacre between Hutu and Tutsi before 1959. In the earlier 20th centuries, German occupied Rwanda and then Belgium until Rwandan independence in 1962. But the damage has been done. When European arrived in Rwanda, they changed many aspects of Rwandan life. They grew, they grew coffee and other crops and exported it to West. This commercial environment pitted one group against the other. The colonial power created identity cards. A person identity, ethnic identity, Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa. A person's ethnic identity determined what kind of opportunity were available. <laughs> This beauty resentment with turned violent over the years. With the full support of colonial power, extremist Hutu started the violence against the Tutsi in 1959. Tens of thousands of Tutsi were killed. Hundreds of thousands of Tutsi fled the neighboring countries. Those who remained in the country were targeted for extermination. The media, the school, the government fostered the idea of internal enemy. And the word Inyenzi, mean cockroach, was used to dehumanize the Tutsi population. Finally, the civil war broke out in Rwanda. Rwandans outside the country created the Rwanda Patriotic, Patriotic Front. The RPF was joined by the Hutu who did not agree with the extermination of the Tutsi. And then the liberation war broke out in 1990. When President Habyarimana felt the pressure of the RPF, 
he reluctantly agreed to form a coalition government at the meeting in Arusha, Tanzania. A ceasefire was declared, then collapsed. The Arusha Peace Accord was signed in 1993. The ceasefire was not genuine. It was a mean of buying time. The fragile peace began to break down, in part because the propaganda was used as an important tool to spread the hate. More than 220 newspapers and journals incited hatred toward the Tutsi in the lead up to the genocide. On the night, night of April 6, 1994, when he was returning to Rwanda from further talk about the Arusha court, President Habyarimana was killed when his plane was shot down over the capital city, Kigali. He was killed by extremists in his own party. But the Tutsi people became the scapegoat for the killing. Then a full scale of genocide began. It continued to 400 days. More than 1 million people were killed. More than 300 children were orphaned. There were thousands of widows, men of whom were the victim of rape and sexual abuse. Many had seen their own children murdered. The streets were looted with dead bodies. Rwanda was a country destroyed. I survived the genocide. And today, I want to share with you my personal journey. One year ago, I sat down with this man, Samson Guajindo, in Nyanza prison in Rwanda. He murdered my, my family during the genocide 1994 against the Tutsi. It was 14th of April, 1994. It was the day my home and my childhood ended. I was a typical teenager. I played football. My favorite thing was to celebrate with my family, eating seated around a big table. My dream was to be a doctor, but Tutsi were not allowed to go into prestigious subject like a medicine. So I hoped to, to study nursing because I enjoyed helping people. I was 18 years old. April 13 was the last time I saw my mom. She brought me some passion fruits. She knew I didn't like it, but it was all she had. Eat this, it will be okay. If you survive, be strong and be a man. Today, passion fruit still reminds me of the last meal. On April 14th, they come for my family. We hid as best, as best we could. I hid in the house of my friend Peter. I hid without hope. Yes, certain the death was near. There were no many Tutsi in, left to kill in our neighborhood. So more, most of the 60 perpetrators wanted to join the attack to our home, and Samson was the leader of the group. He was a strategist explaining the others how no one of my family must escape. They first took my parents away. I heard the letter that they, they killed them with the machetes and the clubs. When I met Samson one year ago in the prison, he told me that among his group, they were specialists in killing children. Those specialists killed my four little sisters, Console, Angelique, 
Taurus and Illumine. After clubbing them, they threw them alive into a septic tank. I could hear their screaming and crying for help. In the 48 hours, we were reduced from a family of eight to two. I also lost 80 members, 80 zero members of my extended family. Only my younger sister, Rosette, and I survived. When I visited Samson in a prison last year, Rosette came with me. Samson told us that local leaders had enjoyed as encouraged the Hutu men to enjoy themselves with Tutsi women as they would be killed later anyway. Rosette was 15 years old in 1994. Samson turned to her and said that he planned to rape her, but he had too many women to go through and he dig it back around to her before she escaped. The international community in 1994 looked away and left the victims in the hands of killers. However, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, led by His Excellency President Paul Kagame, refused to stand by and state, defeated the genociders and liberated Rwanda. But our country and our life were near destroyed. 30 years may sound long enough, but for me, I still hear the cries like it was yesterday. We in Rwanda also needed to find and bury the dead. But how can we create a memorial when our hearts are still breaking? How do we honor the dead? How do we tell the story of genocide? The Rwandan authority wanted to create a way to remember the genocide. This was a little bit close to 10 years after genocide. They got the inspiration to create an education memorial to the UK National Holocaust Center. The UK National Holocaust Center was created by founders of Aegis Trust, James and Stephen Smith. The two brothers were invited to Rwanda to help to create the Kigali Genocide Memorial. We made a choice that in Rwanda, remembering should also mean the healing. I joined AG Trust in uh, 2004, ahead of the opening of the Kigali Genocide Memorial. As a young man, I committed to repairing my nation. I was asked in 2008 to develop Aegis Trust education programming in Rwanda. But I had to figure out about the nature of forgiveness and resilience. So I invited some of those involved in killings, those who killed my family, to be my guests. They came to visit and become my guests, and we all we visited and I took around the Kigali Genocide Memorial. But I was surprised. But by one man in particular, you can see the arrow goes to his head. A big killer doing genocide. When he arrived, he began to cry. I had thought that this man had lost his humanity. But I realize even perpetrators still has, have a human spark inside them. I began to listen to the perpetrators. Learning from perpetrators, including the killers of my own family, helped me to create a peace education program. Our aim was to build empathy, critical thinking, and the values that lead to a personal responsibility. We at Aegis Trust piloted our peace education program in 2008. By 2023, 
2013, we had expanded the peace education program to 22 of the 30 districts of Rwanda. In 2014, the Rwanda Education Board announced that our peace and value education program would be part of the new curriculum in the Rwandan schools. In short, when we began, there were no formal teaching in Rwanda about genocide. This might sound familiar to you. Many countries, including the United States, struggle with how to teach about the worst part of their history. We in Rwanda do not look away from our history. Today, our peace education program at Kigali Genocide Memorial impact educational experience of two and a half million Rwandan students per year. The peace education program disarm heart and mind. Let me share some of the examples of its impact in Rwanda. To be clear, our peace education program has been shared, shared in seven other countries in Africa. But let me focus today on Rwandan examples. One of the students said, thank you for saving my life and the life of people I was about to kill. My plan was to join the army, get a gun, back to my village, and kill people who killed my family in 1994. The second example is about the two heroes you can see here, Maria and Philbert. Maria was ma married with her four children before the genocide. During the genocide, her husband and her children were killed, except her small baby she carried on her back. All her extended family were killed also, except her mother, she found after genocide. She had two siblings with families, but they were all killed and none survived. Philbert, age 19 at the time, was one of the killers. He had begun, he had been taught that the Tutsi were bad people, and it was his duty to kill them. That it was good to run and all who are good runners should do this. He subsequently went to prison and then learned that that was not the right thing to do. He had the great most in his world. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. He had the great remorse for his role during genocide. When he, be, when he came out from the prison, he looked for Maria to ask for forgiveness. After all, they were living in the same small village together. After much time and support from others, both survivors and perpetrators, they become friends. Philbert now helps to farm her land and repair her house. He also teach others about the danger of prejudice. Maria has become an expert in solar energy, including visiting New York for training. Philbert says that Maria made him human again. Maria says that he, she lost so much during the genocide that now it is like she has a new relative. A, re a recent visitor to Rwanda uh, who met Maria and Philbert at Kigari Genesis Memorial said the following, and I quote, those two hours changed my life. Within 10 minutes, I was able to forgive two people who I thought I would never forgive. Maria and Philbert gave me perspective that my woes were nothing compared to what we witnessed.
I'm a man of hope in a resilient, vibrant, and secure nation. But I also know that we live in a very complicated world. We at AG Trust are called every day to take the lesson from Rwanda and to take it to places in conflict around the world. AG Trust this summer, we launched the Isoko Peace Institute. This is a 10 acre sister acres. Sister campus will be located 15 minutes from the new airport in Bugisera. It's a near the animal leading to Bigali. The 10 acres of land are purchased. The Isoko Peace Institute will be a destination for peacemakers and resources to the world. It will be a place for archives, for research about genocide and reconciliation, and for bringing together people involved in a global conflict who want to work beyond traditional approaches such as uh, UN, or through government negotiation to reduce the emissions, as we have done in Rwanda. Because our mission at the Aegis Trust is to predict, prevent genocide and mass atrocity, I want to share with you how I see conflict and emergence from conflict. I invite you to think about how many perspectives of peace connect with uh, the work of IRL. At the heart of your work, research, education at the IORA is an excellence. It's excellence in conflict resolution. I understand that many of your students and professors work in high conflict resolution, such as labor negotiation, major league sponsor and sports negotiation, and business mergers. Perhaps you have my you have shared my understanding of how people, organization, and even countries end up in a terrible conflict, and how through preparation and training they can emerge from conflict. In brief, our peace education program teach that there is a path to genocide, and there are path to peace. And that forgiveness is never or, or nothing at all into journey. So I want to share with you how we think about genocide and the emerge and the emergence from genocide. I want to introduce you the Inzovo curve. We at Egypt Trust, we created a graph, but we want to give full credit to scholars who work to influence our work. From this point, I would like you to, to take you to Africa. Are you ready to come with me? Yes. If you got to previous. I want to take you to Africa and I want to take you to a jungle. And I want you to meet my friend Elephant. Can you see my friend? <laughs> And I want you to learn about the Inzovu curve. Inzovu means elephant in my language, in my mother language. And I want you to learn about Inzovu trap. I want also to learn about, about how, about the path to violence. There is a path to violence and there is a 10 steps violence, but there's also 10 steps to peace. Rwanda actually reached the bottom, but Rwanda is also going up uh, to, um, to, the, to the top again. But we are still long way to go, but you are in the right track. 
So I'll go a little bit on um, the, those 10 steps. And these 10 steps, and we have all examples when we do teaching, this is one of the materials we use when we teach about genocide. To understand how gradual process that influence people psychologically to accept and they commit the, the genocide. This work was um, influ uh, was uh, influenced or inspired by uh, Professor Elfin Stau. He's a retired professor at Massachusetts uh, University. And um, I met him and he was working for a nonprofit organization called La Benevolencia. This graph, I hope you still, you kept in mind the first graph. This is actually what is very important. The graph uh, that was inspired uh, from my friend Elephant. This graph actually helps, helps us to go through these steps. And um, I would like to say the step one, which is difficult conditions, we have examined, we have went through these uh, uh, steps, uh, um, and then each and every time in Rwanda, we have examples. As I mentioned before, with the different conditions, with the introduction of the, um, of the colonial power, forced labors, and this actually created the very harsh conditions and then the life start to be deteriorated in my country. So this can be economic pressure that can make our life deteriorated, can be political pressure, can be social pressure and others. What as a human we do, we feel we have a fear and we want to be in a safe place. We want to be comfortable. In that, in that time, we go to next two, to step two, and we want to join groups that actually makes, makes us more comfortable. So by doing that, this group can be ethnic group, can be people you share the ideology, can be other groups that really make you much more comfortable. When you get there, you know what you created? You already created us and them. And then that time you go, you, you're already on the step three. And once you create them and there, you started actually to discriminate the other group. And that group, you, you deprive them on the basic uh, human rights. You blame them all your problems you have in the world. You say that they are rich because they have taken their wealth, they have, you know, whatever. And I can see, um, while I'm talking about this one, probably you can imagine some of examples in our own communities. So we go to uh, step five, where you try to, because you have joined that group, and those groups have leaders, and you start actually to agree the ideology that those leaders actually uh, teach. In that time, you, you start even scapegoating them. So this actually on uh, step, uh, step five, it's very, very crucial step because this is how the countries and the communities are getting different because the warning signs are already there. But what saved the community is how the government, the, uh, the countries, the peace actors actually behave. If you're bystanders, if you don't do anything, then this community goes in a very long direction. So they, if nothing happens and we have bystanders in Rwanda, it happened because all the steps we went through, no one have done some, anything. UN actually said, these are tribes, these are tribes' problems. And this actually is Africa. No one has to do anything about it. And that they cross from uh, phase six to, phase, to step seven, where, of course, the uh, social structure is already there to perpetuate this, this hatred. And then go to step eight, where actually, because on step, uh, step seven, some of the groups you find um, 
some sporadic actually crimes that again happen. Some someone you find in you in your uh, in the streets, you will see your color, or you see the, how tall you are, and they start to hit you, and nobody does something. So this on step seven is where you you find there's impunity that's happening, and when the impunity does happen, everyone think that doing what they're doing and those those crimes is normal. Then the leaders of the um, of the group start picked up uh, picked that up and start all manipulation. Use the speech, uh, head speech. They manipulate all the group or that group because they are acceptable and they're very easy to be influenced. So you recruit even more and more. So on step nine, there is an increase of violence, and this thing, the violence is really justified. In Rwanda, because um, they even reached at the point they did all the humanization. The Tutsi were called, they called cockroaches. They were called snakes. And when they, they kill them, the uh, people who kill them, they were not feeling they killed human beings. So that's actually how, how the point, uh, it reached the point that the killers, they even enjoy it in the field that they are so patriotic to do it. And then there's a fail in the a failed state, which um, happened in my country. And um, the situation is not controllable. There's no way uh, you can control these killings and the genocide happens. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the, the other step, but um, maybe you can take pictures, but it's self-explanatory and how it works. But this actually helps us uh, to continue uh, our education. So this is my friend then, and my friend in Zovu, my friend uh, Elephant, now, now I can take you back to America, right? Um, because we want to support more people, more communities, and more countries in conflict, we are building the Isoko Peace Institute. I'm going to share you, with you some of the slides and uh, probably you can uh, be able to read. And we have a vision, and this is really our vision. This vision, and I'll need to tell you before I talk more uh, what I want to tell you. I want to, maybe you're asking yourself why people should be uh, supporting the vision of Peace Institute, Isoko Peace Institute in Africa, in Rwanda. The most important thing that we have is we have uh, forgiveness in the practice. We have survivors and perpetrators, and we want people can and see them. Those are our teachers of humanity. And, um, and I want people in the room, please um, let's join our hands together and support this vision. How can you do that? First, you can attend the conference in Rwanda. We are organizing a conference in July 2024. And they will bring together people from around the world and the community, and those people who are committed of peace and the work they are doing on forgiveness, reconciliation, and transformation of justice. We are creating a conference in partnership with Tufts University and the University of Rwanda. So the link is um, on one of the slides here, but I give it even. Uh, say it. The link we have is event.agistrusts.org. You can share your idea with us about how you think the peace in this institute should work. We spend a lot of time and a lot of money thinking about waging war. What would be it mean to wage um, peace? We are creating the Soko Peace Institute to work in the meaningful, effectively, and uh, intelligently on the cause and the solution of genocide and the mass atrocity. Using the lesson of Rwanda, but also using 
the experience we have uh, by implementing the peace education program in, in Rwanda. You can also introduce us to people who are care, who care about these uh, issues, so that more and more people joining uh, in the hands, the more we can reach up uh, to create this center. You can take the risk to believe with us that peace is possible. If you take that risk, we are on a journey together. For more information, we have a QR code here that will give you more information about Isoko Peace Institute. I didn't tell you what Isoko means. You don't, don't think that is a Japan name <laughs> because it sounds like a Japan, Japan name, but it's, it's a Rwandan name. And this Rwandan name means um, source. Can be well spring, the source of water, the well spring of water. But if you say Isoko, now you change the meaning of it and it become a market. So, um, but both are very important. It can be a source of humanity. It can be also a marketplace where we exchange ideas. Everything actually have a very meaningful um, explanation. So finally, if peace and reconciliation are achievable in Rwanda after 1994 genocide, then peace and reconciliation are achievable everywhere in this world. So you are welcome to visit us at any time in Rwanda to learn about what we have to share with the world as we have shared with you today. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for a really uh, wonderful talk. Um, it's it's both a you know very painful kind of uh, reminder of a really truly horrific event, but also I think Rwanda tells us uh, this hopeful story of the uh, process of uh, striving for peace and, uh, in a way that I think has profound lessons for uh, for the whole world. Uh, but he's uh, willing to take some questions, so I'd like to open up to the audience um, and also the people online. Uh, you can put some questions online. We'll have somebody taking those as well. So, uh. Sorry, I got a little excited there. <laughs> um, thank you for your... Turn this off. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I think I'm from Sudan. And it's been a very dark year. And I was just in Rwanda, and that was my first epiphany of hope in a year. Um, we've been through so much. I personally lost my grandmother to starvation. I've lost my uncle. My grandfather was shot. My father was put at gunpoint. My cousin was killed. My aunt was killed. And I've reached a point because we've lost everything. My family's become refugees overnight. We're still mourning. We're unable to bury our loved ones. You know, they, they aren't even merciful to allow us to bury my own grandmother. Her body was it's there at home for eight months. I can't, I don't have it in me to ever forgive or forget what they've done. And my question is, because I am doing my research, scope of research right now on reconciliation and building Sudan after the war, how do you reach that point? How do you reach a point of forgiveness? How do you let go of the past when the past haunts you every single day? Thank you. Yeah, first of all, sorry for the loss. Um, I've been some time that we and the world watching uh, what is going on in Sudan, starting from the time of Darfur and up to now we see the, the history is repeating itself. And um, by the way, um, it's one of the silent, actually, now the world is very, very silent. I think we have so many uh, atrocities and there's so many uh, problems going on in, around the world. And this actually, I have to say that uh, it's an unfortunate that we don't see the atrocities that is being committed in Sudan in newspapers. 
you have you asked me a very good question and i will try to respond to that and the reason why i'm saying this is um forgiveness is is a journey and it's possible if you cannot forgive now, if you're not able to forgive now, I can't blame you. It's really, really, you have that right. And it's a journey. And it may take time. For me, it took 17 years even to think about it. The first year, I take up to 10 years. If you talk about forgiveness, I get angry, I get out of the room. But Two things or three things actually came up that helps me to start the journey. And I have to say, the most important things in, to, in not to reach at the point you meet your perpetrator, you greet, you hug, is to become a friend. This is not, for me, is not the most important things. What is very important for survivors is to even to start the journey, to think that forgiveness is possible. You already have done a great. So for me, um, um, I was helped by the work I'm doing. By running the Kigali James Memorial, I have to ask myself questions. Is this memorial going always to accuse the perpetrators, the children of perpetrators, or this memorial is going to be to play a big role in repairing our nations and the social public, and but also to learn from the past. Second, I said it in my speech. I was asked to develop the peace education program. Of course, in my um, basic education, I I studied nursing, but I quit nursing to education and become. Um, educator. So that's why I was asked to develop a curriculum on peace education. But the peace education was a big challenge for me because you cannot give what you don't have. If you, they ask you to develop a peace education program that really help people to reconcile, help people to forgive, help people to come on the to come together in dialogue about their own problems, as we do, I had to test myself. And this actually was my path. And um, by meeting people who killed my family in my village, by bringing them to the memorial, by going to prison to meet Samson. And by the way, I have to say that uh, what I wanted from Samson is the truth. I went to see him. If he would say and tell me the truth and the ask of forgiveness, I would say I forgive you because I was prepared for that. But he didn't, he didn't take the chance. He didn't take, take the chance because he started actually lying at me. He told me uh, when he was telling how he, they killed my family, how, and I was at least, I wanted to hear what the last word my mother said? What the last word my uh, siblings say? Did they lay down? Is, is you or anyone actually beat them the first? I want to have those details, but he didn't want to tell me, but he, he knows. But I have a letter, I have a um, message now. He wants me to go back and... and, and but this is actually I'm explaining why I'm explaining this is to say that it's a journey. It's a journey and um, and it come when it come. It's no, but at the same time, what we can do as a human being, and my contribution to you is to tell you today that um, forgiveness is possible. And what what the benefit, and at some point. I want to make it to, to, to mention something and actually the third one is to try to understand why should I forgive? 
because living with anger is not really helpful as well. Living with anger, it kills. But when you're able to release, it becomes beneficial, this forgiveness becomes beneficial to you. So forgiveness is not only for perpetrators, forgiveness is for survivors. First, you feel relieved, they are there, you are not here, and sometimes you may forgive someone you don't see because you want to relieve uh, the anger from your body. So my contribution today is not to tell you how to forgive, the way to forgive and how to do that, but my contribution today to tell you forgiveness is possible. Sorry, I cannot answer the question, but I can make a contribution. Uh, somebody, a uh, question at the back there? Yeah. No. Um, on your chart of paths to benevolence, where do you feel your country is on that chart? Are you at a eight or three? The country, possibly. Um, that. You could, that one. Yes. Um, it is hard to respond because we are, we are dealing with the human behaviors. But what I have to say, you will see signs on all the on the steps. You may find some people still indifferent. They're still down here. They, can, they don't even to talk about it. You may find those people in my country. You may find some people start to open up, but they, know they don't want to meet the per 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 perpetrators. It's hard to take a country as a whole country, everyone at the same time. You feel that you have the same thinking. But what I'm, what I'm, uh, I'm um, seeing, we have uh, so many majority of, these people, uh, of people start actually uh, on the uh, community feeling a fellowship with others. And this we have at the constellation of villages um, where people live together and perpetrated survivors. And this actually, maybe you may um, ask me the speed that Rwanda took. And maybe there's uh, so many uh, things actually, the leadership have been involved. The um, international NGOs like Egypt has been very much involved. The um, other countries like um, your for the um, U.S. citizens, citizens, you've been uh, your taxpayers. Actually, USA have been really uh, contributing a lot in terms of uh, putting some uh, uh, means. You need really a lot of actors to lift up the people, and the leadership. What they did is to make sure at least people have physical security. Physical security is very, very important. And then others can start working on, on uh, mental uh, and also what we can see, you cannot see. Uh, sorry for my English. But, <laughs> but what you can see, you cannot see is about uh, your behaviors and, and the attitude and the other things. But it's all spread there. But what we can see today, we start actually, I have I've seen a lot on stage eight. On stage eight, when the connections you you take from stage seven, where you 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 connect with the perpetrators, but it starts actually to have an impact in the community. I don't know if this is an answer or not. Yeah. Wait, anyone else? Yeah. Another question in the room. <laughs> Um, yeah, at the back. Yeah. So, Rose, you're going to make me go all the way around this room, aren't you? Uh, uh, thank you for, for your talk, and thanks for coming here. Uh, 
My question is about today and, you know, about social cohesion. And so what's the identity of a person in Rwanda today? Is it primarily I am Rwandan or is it I am Tutsi, I am Hutu? And, and, and um, where do you see that social cohesion going nationally? Um, and, and how does it reflect itself in the government or in, you know, positions, power, things like that? Right. Right after genocide, it was very easy to call, if you want to say, you are killer, I don't call it your killer. I'll say your Hutu because the genocide was committed in the name of Hutus. You understand what I mean? So if you say you're your Tutsi, someone may be feeling that you, you are referring to the former, um, actually former, um, uh, names that you want, what you will be next, it will be like a humanization and other things. Calling those names right after genocide, well, really challenging. Because people who you call, they understand it differently. So first we took 10 years where government said, we banned those names. And it was very serious that time. And it was the right things to do. First of all, we had identity cards. The government removed all the identity cards. They don't show um, your ethnicity. They don't show uh, before you have to show your ethnicity and where you come from, because it was the regional division and you had ethnic division. So the government have taken all that together. The second thing that government did, which actually helped in the country was, um, was they did, we didn't take this process of reconciliation or process of uh, social reconstruction or social cohesion as one, one thing. And, and it, it, it took the whole life of the country in, in, this, in the education sector because the discrimination in the education sector was very, very high. I don't know if you can go to, to the... Um, um, to the um, where the the identity card go up up again, yeah. Um, yes. Um, if you want to see the identity card, this is not the identity card. It, this is a, a card, a census card. I was there sixteen years that time. This is mine, and you can see. Um, we had the Hutu, the Tutsi, and Twa, and you put a cross um, on the Hutu, to, uh, Twa, and natural rights. And that was in that time, it shows that I'm a Tutsi. So all papers that identify people, they have to remove ethnicity, right? Not on the identical only, on license, uh, on the driving license, on the scissors like scissors card like this one, on the and then when you go to school because they had what they call the French uh, uh, fish swivers. Um, this you had um, you had the, uh, a form that takes you from primary to other levels up to university. That form more from one part uh, one uh, one um, place to another one according where you're going to study. So that's mean if the headmaster or the principal of the school sees you, first your ethnicity and yourself. So they, they, this, all this was infrastructed. So in army, in, in um, education sector, and um, in the health sector, everywhere, they will have to remove actually this uh, label of Tutsi. But I have to know, we are we are the first we are the same video generation. We know who you are, okay? We may keep quiet, but we know who you are, okay? So um, the ten the first ten years helped actually to 
to, to be used to not talk about it because we were used to do it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, the, we started actually after 15 years, the government starts uh, opening up by creating a program called Amruanan. Dumunyar Rwanda, Amruanan, that was a program that actually so many uh, initiatives was happening, but that's Amruanan was a common identity that we're taking. It may not, because I'm uh, first generation, I'm frustrated, I've seen so many things, but when you go to my children, my children do not actually identify themselves as a Tutsis. If you talk about Tutsi, they feel that there's something that happened in the 50s, like some, something happened. Our hope is our children will grow up with uh, the common identity, um, Rwanda. That actually helps in terms of social cohesion. And also, um, we need to sustain what we, we're trying to do today, because it's very easy to destroy, but it takes time to rebuild. Okay, uh, we're actually the end of our time, so I do want to uh, just finish off by thanking so much uh, Freddie Mutango for a wonderful talk today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.